So I'll officially welcome y'all here in a few moments, but we are doing the Lord's Supper today, so the elements are outside in the foyer of both hallways, so if you haven't gotten that, you might want to do that now, this would be a good time. So we are taking the Lord's Supper today, just wanted you to, to hear that, and they're, again, they're there and both sides here, so. So once again, good morning and welcome. Uh, if you've just come in, two things. We are doing the Lord's Supper this morning, and you can get those elements, those the little cup and the wafer in, in any of the foyers. And also, uh, for anyone who might come in, uh, there's two things that can happen if we're running out of space. Some of our members can move and go to the overflow room, which is available, um, or whoever's coming in can, can go. You can let them know that. So there is an overflow area this morning in the fellowship hall. Is that correct? Okay, so that is available to you. Let's prepare our hearts for worship as Garrett plays to God be the glory. Thank you. 
Well, good morning. Happy Easter. It's good to see you as we come together on this beautiful Lord's Day, and thank you so much for being here. We do have guests with us, and we want you to know we are honored that you took time to come and, and worship with us this morning. We do want to encourage you and remind you that in the pew rack in front of you, there's a card that says Connect, and there's one of those squiggly line things in the bulletin that you can also connect with. Uh, we'd love to have a record of your attendance with us, and if you'd either fill out that card as you leave, you can drop it in an offering box, or you can do whatever you need to do to your phone to fill that out. But anyway, we're glad you're here. We do want to say welcome. We know there are a lot of folks home visiting for Easter, and uh, trust it's been a great weekend. Weather's been about perfect. Uh, our family got a time to get together yesterday. Some of you will today, but it is so good to welcome you here this morning. Uh, just remind you, there are no services, no activities tonight. There are announcements in the bulletin. Please read those and be a part of all that you possibly can. Do want to say thank you for those who uh, did our Easter decorations. We appreciate them so much and uh, reminds us of what Christ did for us on the cross. Well, as we pray today, I know there are people on your heart and mind. We do want to remember uh, the Mary Farrer family. This is Molly Crawford's grandmother passed away. Her funeral was on Friday. Also, uh, the uh, uh, Brad Harris family as well as the Roger Cooley family. Roger was Kevin Cooley's dad. We want to remember them as well. Well, let's join together as we pray. Gracious Father, what a great day to be in the Lord's house. God, we're so thankful for this time we have together, God, to celebrate the greatest event that ever happened, and that is when you walked out of the tomb alive, and Lord, you live forevermore. And God, just as you lived, you give us, gave us the promise that just as you live, so those of us who know you shall live also. God, we thank you for the promise of resurrection, that it is not a vain hope, but God, it is a sure thing. Lord, thank you that, Jesus, you are alive. Lord, we ask for your guidance today as we worship. May everything that's done in this place glorify the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would be honored in it all. And God, if there's someone here today that doesn't know Christ, what a great day on Easter Sunday, 2024. What a great day for someone to give their heart to Jesus. Lord, we pray for that. Lord, we pray that you'll take this time and use it for your own glory, that you may be glorified through all that's done. Lord, we love you. We pray that uh, our worship would be pleasing in your sight this day, O oh Lord. Lead us, guide us, be glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I do want to remind you that as a part of our service today, we will be observing the Lord's Supper together. And uh, if you did not get one of the elements, we will give you an opportunity to do that in a few moments. Uh, there are some uh, on this table. Uh, the ushers will have some here in a few moments. But uh, thank you so much for being here. So at this time, if you'll turn your attention to the screen from last week's baptism. that have really impacted my understanding of, of why we have entered these waters. One of them is Romans 6, and it talks about going from dead to life and the symbolism of baptism. The other one is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And it's a very simple, not an easy, but a very simple command from Jesus to baptize people and to teach them what he's commanded, and that's how you make disciples. And so it's super exciting for me to get to begin that process, although... Kaylee today coming, it's not, we've been teaching, right? Come on down, Kaylee. We've been teaching for a while, but today she gets to come into these waters and she gets to begin this process of the life of a disciple. Not yet. This is Kaylee Carpenter. Everybody said, hey, Kaylee. Kaylee, you have lots of uh, church family here, but you also have some, some family here, so... Good deal. Those people love you. You know they love you, but you've got a church family here that, that loves you also, and we want to see you grow in Christ. And so i got a question for you, Kaylee. What are you so nervous for? Is Jesus Lord of your life? Absolutely. So I want to baptize you, Kaylee. Turn around. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.
in Mark 9, verse 31, Jesus was teaching his disciples and he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Not a word was heard at the tomb that day. Just shuffling soldiers' feet as they guarded the grave. One day, two days, three days had passed. Could it be that Jesus had breathed his life? Could it be that his father had forsaken him, turned his back on his son, despising our sin? All hell seemed to whisper, just forget him, he's dead. Oh, but the father looked down to his son and said Like lightning from heaven, the stone was rolled away, and his dead men, the guards, they all stood there in fright as the power of love displayed its might. And suddenly a melody filled the air, riding.
Welcome to Resurrection Sunday. We will celebrate that today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Amen. Stand and sing that with us. this morning oh precious is the flow that makes us white as snow let's sing it together oh precious Oh 
sing this together. blood that flows. The world outside thinks that's a little strange for us to always be celebrating and talking about blood, but this is the blood that saves. The sacrifice of Jesus saves, and only the fool does not recognize that. So we sing about the blood. We celebrate the blood. We celebrate what Jesus has done, this blood.
There is a blood that calls to life, that paid my way, death its price. And when it flowed down from the cross, my sins were gone, my sins were gone. There is a grave that tried to hide this precious blood that gave me life. In three days he breathed again and rose to stand in He's coming back for you. There is a blood that sights the blind, that heals the sick, the lonely finds. It has the power to free.
that try to hide this precious blood that gave me life. But in three days, he breathed again and rose to stand in my defense. Oh, oh, so my God Dr. Travis used to tell us at Blue Mountain College, any old preacher ought to be able to preach on Easter, especially after that. Thank y'all. My right gracious, that was good. So good, Dane broke both his drumsticks. <laughs> both of them. I not know if that was possible. But anyway, we're glad you're here. I did uh, welcome some of you that usually sit in the balcony, had to come down to the rest of us, didn't you? I understand. <laughs> Next year, we're going to start filling up at the front and move back. Uh, I did hear a story years ago about a preacher that the, his church needed to be rebuilt. And so finally, they, the deacons got him together and they said, Pastor, you go away for a year. Some of you would like to do that, wouldn't you? said, you go away for a year and when you come back, you'll have a new church. Well, he did. And that first Sunday back, he walked in and the deacon said, this is our, your new church. And uh, there was no pews at all. It was just a... The pulpit was up there and the choir loft, but no pews. And uh, the pastor was confused. He said, where's everybody going to sit? They said, just be patient. Well, people started coming in around uh, a little bit before 11. And in the back row, there was some pews popped up out of the floor. And they all, when everybody got on it, they pulled down to the front. They were on a track, and everybody on that row had to come to the front. And it kept doing that until finally, every time we went, the pastor said, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. And finally, after everybody got in and got seated, he said, wow, this is wonderful. And uh, he stood up to preach, and at 12 o'clock, a trap door fell under the pulpit, <laughs> and everybody said, that's wonderful. Well, today is wonderful, and I am glad you're here. 
Uh, in just a few moments, as a part of our service, we are going to be observing the ordinance of the Lord's Supper together, and uh, we'd love for you to be a part of that. So I'm going to ask, Alan, where are you? Okay, Alan, if you did not get one of these when you came in, would you raise your hand? Uh, Alan's got some extras. Uh, guest and all, you know the Lord, we want you to participate. All right. And if you're in the overflow area, there's somebody out in there that's got some. And if you're at home watching, uh, I realize you probably don't have one of these at home, but if you want to make your way to your pantry and, and grab a cracker, or maybe some juice, uh, you're welcome to observe this with us because of the symbolism of it, and we would love for you to participate. All right. Anybody else? All right, that'll be just hold on to that. And uh, this morning, we're going to be thinking on the subject from Passover to resurrection. So if you will, look in Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. I'm going to start reading in verse 42 and read through chapter 16, verse 8. Mark 15. And Mark, by the way, is the shortest of the Gospels, and that may be why I like it so much. But uh, Mark wrote to pretty much a Roman audience... And they were not interested in a lot of the details and would not have been uh, interested in a lot of the details that Matthew, Luke, and John gave. Uh, the Romans were pretty much a, a no-nonsense kind of people. Just give me the facts. And um, so Mark did. He gave, it, he gave them the condensed version. And in chapter 15, beginning in verse 42, he says, Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before Sabbath, the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. And so when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he brought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, observed where he was laid. And now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought, uh, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of uh, the tomb for us? But when they took, looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going, going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb. And they trembled and were amazed. They said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Would you pray with me? Father, we do thank you again for this day, and God, we thank you for that, that Jesus, you are alive, and we come together today uh, to worship you, not only on this Sunday, but Lord, every Sunday, because Jesus, you walked out of the tomb alive on that early that Sunday morning, you transformed every Sunday into Easter Sunday, every Sunday into Resurrection Day, and God, I'm so grateful and God, again, there may be someone here today that's not a Christian. And how we pray that today they will realize that, Jesus, you died for them to pay the debt of their sin. You were buried for them, and you rose again for them. And may they today give their heart to you. Lord, we pray you'll take us where we are and lead us to where we need to be and be glorified in this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. From the book, And the Angels Were Silent. The author writes, it's early in the final week. The props and players for Friday's drama are in position. Six-inch spikes are in the bin. A crossbeam leans against a shed wall. Thorns 
uh, thorn limbs are wrapped around a trellis waiting the weaving of a soldier's fingers. The players are nearing the stage. Pilate is concerned at the number of Passover pilgrims. Annas and Caiaphas are restless over a, a volatile Nazarene. Judas views his master with furtive eyes. A centurion is available waiting the next crucifixions. Players and props, only this is no play. It's a divine plan. A plan begun before Adam fell, uh, felt heaven's breath, and now all heaven waits and watches. All eyes are on one figure, the Nazarene. Commonly clad, uncommonly focused. Leaving Jericho and walking toward Jerusalem. He doesn't chatter. He doesn't pause. He's on a journey. His final journey. Even the angels are silent. They know that this is no ordinary walk. They know this is no ordinary week. For hinged on this week is the door of eternity. Let's walk with him. Let's see how Jesus spent his final days. Let's see what mattered to God. When a man knows the end is near, only the important surfaces. Impending death distills the vital. The trivial is bypassed. The unnecessary is overlooked. That which is vital remains. So if you would know Christ, ponder his final days. He knew the end was near. He knew the finality of Friday. He read the last chapter before it was written and heard the final chorus before it was sung. And as a result, the critical was centrifuge from the casual. Distilled truths taught, deliberate deeds done, each step calculated, every act premeditated. Knowing he had just one week with the disciples, what did Jesus tell them? Knowing it would be his last time in the temple, how did he act? Conscious that the last sand was slipping through the hourglass. So what mattered? For his passion, feel his passion, enter this holy week and observe. Laughing as children sing, weeping as Jerusalem ignores, scorning as priests accuse, pleading as disciples sleep, feeling and sad as Pilate turns. And sensing his power... Blind eyes seeing, fruitless tree withering, money changers scampering, religious leaders cowering, tomb opening. Here is promise. Death has no power. Failure holds no prisoners. Fear has no control. For God has come. God has come into your world to take you to his home. And so on this Easter Sunday, 2024, we worship the fact that Jesus is alive. There was no doubt. So let's follow Jesus on his final journey. For by observing his final journey, we may learn how to make our final journey. So let's take a walk. Let's go with him as he celebrates Passover and institutes the Lord's Supper. We see that. If Let's back up a couple of chapters to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Jesus began that week with the triumphal entry on what we celebrated last Sunday, Palm Sunday. Jesus, you know the story, how he rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And we know that on Monday, he cursed the fig tree. He didn't cuss it. He cursed it, placed a curse on a fig tree that should have been bearing figs but was not on a fruitless life. And we come to Thursday, and there's some arguments and some speculation that say that Passover had to be earlier in the week and Jesus couldn't have died on Friday uh, I was talking with a friend of mine about it this week, and we both have mutual friends that believe that Jesus was crucified on Wednesday, and that may have been. The fact is, he was crucified. The fact is that he was buried. And the fact is that he was dead. And three days later, he rose again. So let's make our way to what we call Monday, Thursday, that Passover event. In Mark chapter 14, Begin in verse 12. It says, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. 
Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will allow you a lar- show you a large upper room tra- furnished and prepared there, make ready for us. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said, said to them, and they prepared the Passover. In the evening he came with the twelve. And as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. One of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one by one, Is it I? Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said to them, It is one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goes, just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him, for that man, if he had never been born. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer eat of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. In Luke's gospel, Luke said, or Jesus said, Do this in remembrance of me. And he was given an ordinance. And he said, every time you do this, you you remember me. You remember my life. You remember my death. You remember the shed blood. You remember my broken body. Do this in remembrance of me. And so the Lord's Supper is a reminder to us of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus would take that Passover event when they would sacrifice the lamb. Do you remember what John the Baptist said when Jesus was baptized as he was walking by the Jordan River? John said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Peter would tell us that we are saved not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. One perfect sacrifice. So what are we to remember? We are to remember his life. The Passover meal was a remembrance meal. It was a meal to remind them to remember what had happened when God had brought them out of bondage in Egypt. When the death of the firstborn and and the death angel would go over and any house that didn't have the blood on the doorpost, there would be a death there. Jesus would fulfill that Old Testament prophecy. He would be that Passover lamb. Mark doesn't give us a lot of detail about the upper room conversations, but he gives us enough. And then if you add the writings of Matthew and Luke and John to what Mark said, if we put it all together, there are several things, uh, details we see about the Lord's Supper. One is Jesus, during that time, at the beginning of that time, would wash the feet of his disciples. We know that Jesus talked to them about his upcoming death and that he was going to a way to prepare a place for them. We read that in John 14 where Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He told them that in that upper room conversation, that dialogue. He also promised the coming of the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send another comforter. And he's going to tell you everything that I've told you. And he will be with you and he will be in you. He also promised, tells them how he would be rejected and crucified even though they didn't understand. It wouldn't be many hours now that Jesus would be arrested in the garden. That he would be taken and would go through six mock trials. And then taken to a cross. It was in that upper room conversation where he announced his betrayer. It was also in that upper room conversation where he announced Peter's denial. And you remember what Peter said, Lord, I will die for you, but I will never deny you. He fell, he passed the test of of words, but he failed the test of practice. He didn't do what he said. He did deny him. And then Jesus also announced that all of them would forsake him. And so Jesus would use this occasion that was so special to the Jewish people. He would use this occasion 
uh, of the Passover to institute the new covenant. The old covenant that had been enforced since the law was given to Moses. And it revolved around keeping rituals and sacrifices. And these rituals and sacrifices look forward to the Messiah who would be God's perfect sacrifice. Jesus died for our sins on the cross. He was buried and rose again on the third day. And every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're celebrating what Jesus did for us on the cross. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11. He said, For I received from the Lord that Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then Paul would add in, in verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So every time we as a congregation come together and we observe the Lord's Supper together as we take that bread, it reminds us that Jesus' body was broken on a cross for us. And every time we drink that juice, we're reminded that it was his blood that was shed for us. By the way, Jesus did not spill his blood. He shed his blood. You spill something by accident. It was no accident. Before the foundation of the world, it was set apart to happen. So I want to pray. And then we're going to observe the Lord's Supper just for this part of the message, and then we'll move on. But we go through that Passover event. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that Jesus gathered on that night, that Thursday evening with his disciples to celebrate Passover, a remembrance event. To remember what you had done for the children of Israel in bringing them out of bondage, out of slavery, and into the promised land. And so, Lord, as we observe the Lord's Supper, we're reminded that you did that for us. You took us out of spiritual bondage. You gave us new life. You were bruised and broken for us. And you shed your blood for us. May we never lose sight of that. May we never get so caught up in all the stuff of the world that we forget what you did for us. And so, Lord, in these moments, as we observe this ordinance, Lord, use this time for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. So let's do this together. If you're in the overflow, you're welcome to. If you're home and watching, I mentioned maybe grab a, a wafer or a cracker or some juice. Um. If you're a guest, we want you to be a part of this. And we've done these, and uh, first of all, if you will, there's a thin, very thin sheet on top. If you pull a thick sheet, you're going to get to the juice first. But if you pull that thin sheet, you're going to get to the wafer first. So we'd ask that you do that. You take the wafer, and you remember what Jesus said. He had bread, a loaf of bread, and it was sitting there on the table. And, and we can, in our mind, almost picture Jesus and his disciples reclining, not sitting at a table like we do, but reclining at the table, the Bible says. And Jesus picked up that loaf of bread, and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, like this bread is broken, my body's going to be broken. And Jesus said to his disciples, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. On that same night, Jesus also took the cup. And he said, this cup, this is the new covenant in my blood. And this juice is a reminder that Christ shed his blood for us. John says that nothing is cleansed without blood. And we're cleansed for the, the remission of our sins. So... On that night, Jesus passed that cup around. They each took it, and they were reminded they didn't know. We look back to the cross. They were looking forward to the cross. 
So on that night, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood which is shed for you. And that night, when they finished, they sang a hymn. And they went out into the Mount of Olives. It was a psalm. Well, Craig, I didn't tell you to do this, but stand up where you are and lead us in singing, Blessed be the tie that binds. Can you do that? We'll sing it a cappella. Is it in there? Is it in there? Or pick something there? I should have given him a warning. It's a fellowship meal. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Paul was writing to them, and he was giving them instructions that when they came together, that this part of the meal, this would be a fellowship time. And so for us it is. that we, It reminds us that we are one in the bond of love. We are one in Christ. And Paul says there's neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, uh, bond nor free, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. And what a great promise that is. Well, hey, I observe Passover, and Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, and then they went out, they went through, down through the Kidron Valley, and they went up into the garden, Jesus would be arrested, but then he would be crucified. So if you will, look in Mark chapter 16, or 15, and we're reminded that Jesus died for us on the cross. He didn't just pass out from the exhaustion and loss of blood. He died. No doubt about it, he died. Let me begin reading in verse 16 of Mark 15. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. And they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. And they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon of Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, and by the way, we would learn later from Jewish history that Alexander and Rufus would become leaders in the early church. And as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink. He did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments and cast in lots for them to determine what every man should take. And that was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. And so the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroyed the temple and built it in three, and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Can't help but wonder if some of those who mocked him that day were in the same crowd that just a few days before on that uh, triumphal entry, if some of those that mocked him on Friday were in the cross that said, uh, that held him as King of kings and Lord of lords on Sunday. 
said likewise the chief priests, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said he saved others himself. He cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. And now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the, until the ninth hour. And the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by him, when they heard it, that said, look, he's calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge and put a, full of sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And so when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he had cried out like this and breathed his last, said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Jesus is crucified. Friday, we celebrated and called it Good Friday. You can't help but ask what was good about Good Friday. Well, it was good for us. Good Friday was good for us because Jesus died for us. He took your punishment, my punishment upon himself. He took our place. There's an old song that said, I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. But Jesus, God's son, took my place. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, uh, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You say there's no greater marker of man's sin than the cross. There is nothing that will show us the depth of man's sin as much as the cross. And there's also there's no greater expression of God's love than the cross. J. Sidlow Baxter wrote, think again of the fact that he died. That in itself is a strange marvel. Remember, he was God the Son. He had to become human in order to be even capable of death. It is a mysterious wonder that God the Son could die. Still more that he should die. Still more that he would die. And most of all that he did die. And he did. He died and he was buried. And then came Sunday. Aren't you thankful for Sunday? Aren't you thankful that Friday didn't have the last word? Aren't you thankful that the cross wasn't the end for Jesus? So look, if you will, in Mark chapter 16. We're not, we just read that as we began our message. But we know that we observe today Easter Sunday. Josh McDowell wrote, After more than 700 hours of studying the subject and thoroughly investigating its foundation, talking about the crucifixion, he said, I have come to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the most wicked, vicious, heartless hoaxes ever foisted upon the minds of men. Or it is the most fantastic fact of history. D. James Kennedy, who was the founder of Evangelism Explosion, wrote, The evidence of the resurrection has been examined more carefully than the evidence of any other fact in history. Again, McDowell said, Death was not the end of Jesus, and his resurrection shows that it need not be the end of us. Easter is good news because it proclaims every year the truth that Jesus is alive. He has conquered death. And David Jeremiah wrote, The resurrection is the most important doctrine in the Bible because if Jesus didn't do what he said he would do which was to come back from the grave after three days we can't believe anything else that he said but Jesus did do what he promised he would do he did come back and we do celebrate that and Paul gives us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 that entire chapter deals with the resurrection but just listen to these verses Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. You know what gospel means, don't you? Good news. He said, I declare to you the good news, the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you receive, and which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received. Here's the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. That's the gospel. That's everything about the gospel. That he died, he was buried, and he rose again. 
That's the gospel. He died. He was buried and he rose again. And so on this Easter Sunday morning, 2024, do you know this resurrected Lord? I want us to just bow for a moment. As we move from Passover, from the Lord's Supper, to the cross, to the empty tomb. That's the gospel. He died, and he died for you. He was buried, and he was buried for you. Because you see, he went where our greatest fear lies. And that's the grave. And he conquered it for us. Death has no power over the believer. Father, you know every heart, you know every life in this place today. God, you know us so much better than we know ourselves. Thank you for the cross. But mostly, thank you for the resurrection. And the cross event, and the shed blood of Christ, we have forgiveness of sin and salvation. And in the resurrection, we have the promise of resurrection power. Father, if there's someone here today that's not a Christian, how we pray that today will be for them the day of salvation. For those of us that are saved, that we would be reminded once again of what Christ did for us. And this is that message that we share with a world that's lost. It's the message that they too can know Christ. So Lord, move in our hearts today and move in these moments. And God, whatever decisions need to be made, we give it all to you and give you all the glory in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's stand together as we sing our hymn of invitation. Number 136, Are You Washed in the Blood? You know Christ? I can't think of a better day today than today to give your heart to Jesus. We'll wait for you if you're in the balcony. I know it's crowded, and those standing beside you will step back and let you out. But nothing in this world more important than your decision to trust Christ. Let's sing together. Have you been to Jesus for That's the, the question. cleansing power? Have you been Are to him? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood Only you can of the that question. Lamb? Are you washed? this were to be your last day on this earth, that you have all the assurance that heaven would be your home. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? That's good. Amen. Oh, we, that's good. All right. Thank you all for being here. Hope you have a great day. Let me just say to those of you who are guests uh, down this hallway on my keep going, and on the right, there's a welcome center. There's coffee, water. Folks will be in there to greet you, fellowship with you. Everyone's welcome to go by there on your way to Sunday school. But thank you so much for coming and being a part of our, our worship experience today. Hope you have a great Easter. All right, I know I shook hands with Norris. Where are you? Right there. All right. Craig just handed me this and said, whoever closes in prayer, give them the microphone. So, Brother Norris, Dr. Groves, would you lead us in our closing prayer? Thank you. Let's pray. Father, it, is, it has been good to be in your house today and to sing about how you have conquered death Lord, to remember what you have done for us, we thank you for the opportunity to worship a risen king. We thank you for the hope that today brings for our lives. And Lord, my prayer is that each and every one of us here would serve you as Lord. And that we would live in victory knowing that even death has no hold on us because of what you've done. And Lord, I pray that you would place on our hearts even now those who need to know that. And help us to share. Bless this church, Lord. Bless Brother David and those who lead in it. Father, I pray you'd use it to 